Once again, guys, there you have it. Of course, welcome back to the Ezzy Spotlight Live podcast. And I told you we're going to be talking about immigration law today. Of course, business immigration law. And I have the specialist. Of course, she is no stranger to business immigration law and family law. Of course, her name is Elizabeth G. She's the founding attorney of the G Law Firm headquartered here in Atlanta. Uh, the business actually focuses on corporate and family law. Okay, that's immigration law, that is. Uh, Elizabeth has an extensive background and knowledge in the field of immigration law and has been recognized as a 2023 Georgia rising star, super lawyer rising star, that is. Okay, so that means she's she's really good at what she does. <laughs> she's an all-star. Uh, prior to practicing law, Elizabeth earned her Bachelor's of Arts with a dual majors in political science and international studies in the Ohio State University. Uh, because of her tenacity, commitment to excellence and hard work, she was a recipient of several prestigious academic awards or scholarships, that is. She has a team that is that serves pretty much the entire United States. I don't know how she did it, but of course, you know, many times we talk we look at uh, certain businesses, you only restrict it to certain uh, states, but she has a team that represents and can actually do business in every state of the United States of America. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Ms. Elizabeth G here live to the Ezzy Spotlight Podcast. Good evening. Thank you for having me here today. How, how are you doing today, ma'am? Uh, I'm a little nervous. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> you, you are. This is, this is okay. We're going to have okay. a great conversation. Yes, that's the plan. How do you feel to be here today? Uh, I feel honored. Um, I never thought that, um, you know, I could kind of extend or share my message and mm -hmm. share what I do um, with so many people through this type of medium. Right. And I'm so glad that, you know, the stars align for us to be here tonight. No, absolutely. I want to say shout outs to uh, Impact Branding for making this happen, Miss Natasha Davis, because uh, here at the Ezzy Spotlight Podcast or the live stream, what I, what I call it as well, is we want to be able to inform people, educate them about things that they don't know. And uh, once I saw your information, I'm like, you know, we have a lot of attorneys to talk about immigration and family immigration, but how many people really talk about the business aspect of immigration law? And there's so many different aspects to it that we don't even know about. Right. And I was reading up your web, I went to your website. Okay. I did my research. <laughs> okay, good. Good for you. <laughs> and I saw all of the information you had on there and I'm like, this is, um, this is incredible. So I was really excited to have this conversation with you today. Likewise. Yeah, I prepared extensively for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, once again, so to everyone who's already in the chat room, we have folks already checking in. Of course, guys, don't forget, if you want to be a part of this conversation, you can join us in the chat room, or you can also call 404-910-2191. That's 404-910-2191. So uh, where, where do we start? I mean, I, I'm going to let you just get into the conversation and you say what you want to say a little bit, just a little sure. intro. Um, well, I mean, I want to introduce myself mm -hmm. as um, uh, a 1.5 generation Korean American. So what that means is I was born in Korea, mm -hmm. but came to the United States when I was very young. I was six when okay. I came, um, didn't speak any English and uh, started school right away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had to learn fast right. and learn quick. Um, but and I share that because um, as an immigration attorney, I feel like the profession chose me as opposed to me choosing this profession. Why? Um, it's always been around me. Mm -hmm. And I got curious on, you know, how our family immigrated or how we ended up here. Right. Um, you know, my family uh, immigrated as the pet or beneficiaries of family based immigration, meaning we were sponsored by one of my father's siblings. Right. And back then, um, you know, the sibling of a U.S. citizen petition didn't take so long. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, the backlog wasn't as bad as right. it is today. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, only took a couple of years for um, us to, you know, us to be here. And um, just throughout life, I've always interacted with folks who were in the space, mm -hmm. never really um, defined it until, you know, I decided that, you know, um, it was time for me to go to law school. Uh, I wanted to be a lawyer since I was in the second grade okay. and, um, you know, basically live my life for, for that objective. <laughs> right. Although I took like a, a long way, you know, to becoming a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, I took like a 10 year, 10 year break between um, getting my undergrad degree and eventually going to law school because right. I just had so many interests. 
Right. I had to try everything out before I <laughs> <laughs> committed to law school. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And once I ended up here, um, I... Oh, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, all, that's all audience. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so once I ended up here, I knew that, you know, I never looked back. And when I became an entrepreneur and started my own firm, mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to help other entrepreneurs and business owners. And right. That's why I focused on business immigration or corporate immigration. Right. Um, but it doesn't mean that I don't help, you know, all types of immigrants. Mm -hmm. It's just that my specialty includes... Um, helping businesses and employers specifically and right. investors who want to uh, come to the United States by making an investment in a business or starting their own. No, this is, no, this is really interesting because uh, we know a lot of people like us. I mean, I'm an immigrant as well from the Caribbean and uh, I know the, the challenge and the hardship that I experienced, that we experienced, especially coming in your case, you came sponsored for me. I came mm -hmm. here and I had to obtain my documentations, my legal status or change my status from right. a visa uh, to a green card and to a citizenship. Mm -hmm. And I know how challenging that could be, especially when you don't have someone to sponsor you. Right. Uh, but from a business standpoint, this is really important because for the folks who are watching us live right now and those of you who are going to be watching this video, many times, and I say this to myself, we, we're here in the United States of America, you would think that um, we can find great talent or good talent for our businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and we, but many people don't know that there is a possibility of gaining that talent beyond our borders. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And this Absolutely. is what you do. Which is yes. really interesting, which is yes. really exciting as a matter of yes. fact. Um, I think businesses, I think bigger businesses, mm -hmm. like bigger conglomerate corporations have always known and have always leveraged right. their access to global talent mm -hmm. to grow their business and to succeed right. in, their, in their spaces. And I think it's, you know, smaller business owners think, oh, my God, this is so expensive it's or it's so complicated. What I can can't I do? do it. Right. I may not qualify as an employer, but it's not, it's usually not true. So. Mm. And it, it takes the willingness of businesses to take a chance mm -hmm. on a foreign national. Right. And usually I love working, you know, I love working with all of my employer clients, but um, I especially enjoy working with like the, you know, company that sponsors one right. or two. Right. And when we have that initial conversation and they're like, well, can I even have this person or can this person work for me? How do I, you know, do the paperwork right so that they can be with me and just not worry and do their work? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're in the right place. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's have a conversation. Absolutely. There you go. Once again, guys, <laughs> if you're just joining us, uh, we have Miss uh, Mrs. Elizabeth G here from the G uh, Law Firm here. We can talk about business immigration and, of course, family immigration as well. Uh, but we're going to spend a lot more time talking about the cooperate aspect of that, of that law because uh, we, we know the common conditions that are, that happens with families coming here, but from the business standpoint, how can businesses, how can local small businesses, like you just mentioned, benefit from the immigration law that is in place? We don't know a lot of the stuff. Mm -hmm. She knows all of it. <laughs> well, maybe not all, <laughs> but most, yeah. She knows most of it, okay. All right, so what, what are some of the most common challenges uh, families face when it comes to immigration law and getting the families here? So. Uh, from an employer's perspective or from families in general? Uh, uh, from families in general. I think uh, immigration across the board, um, the biggest challenge would be access to good information, mm -hmm. correct information, not, you know, sound bites, not, you know, taglines that are going to capture people's attention, mm -hmm. but really information that is customized to your specific need and your specific situation. I think uh, immigration has to be customized and tailored to your needs because mm -hmm. everybody's situation is different. Absolutely, because I've, I've heard people uh, said a lot of things as it relates to immigration about this person say that and that person say that. Why not listen to the experts or do your own research? Right. Even with, you know, doing your own research, you know, um, of course, I always appreciate when my clients come with information mm -hmm. and show that they've done their due diligence, mm -hmm. especially about me, my firm, what we do and what they want. Because um, it helps us kind of focus on how to get there as opposed to, you know, exploring the different options. But in that conversation, some of my clients don't even know that they have more than one option. Mm -hmm. So it's always a good thing to have options because all you need to do is choose. 
And sometimes, you know, eliminating options that are not for you right. kind of helps you arrive at the solution that is meant for you. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Now, uh, one of the next questions I have for you here is um, immigration laws are constantly changing. How do you stay up to date uh, with all of these changes and to be able to relay that information to your clients? Uh, I have lots of friends <laughs> <laughs> who are also, you know, immigration lawyers. Mm -hmm. But, you know, actually, you know, AILA, it stands for the American Immigration Lawyers Association, mm -hmm. is a large organization, a, a globe or it's like a national organization, and they have um, smaller state-specific chapters. Right. And having membership in that gives you access to all of the policy work that they're doing behind the scenes. Mm. Um, any changes or advocacy work that we need to take part of. Right. But most importantly, I think, you know, keeping um, a really strong group of colleagues that you hold in high esteem and who hold you in high esteem is also very important because, you know, we're human. Right. We're not perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, becoming a solo practitioner, meaning I'm the only attorney at my firm. Okay. And I have no one to talk to sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> right. I got to look at the wall and say, hey, I'm thinking this about a case. And you know, um, is this right? right? Or is this the best thing that we can do? Um, I have a policy where I'll never let my ego or my own personal views mm -hmm. affect how I counsel a client. If I don't know, I will tell you I don't know. Right. But the difference is I will... I have the way, like I have the ability to go find the answers right. probably a lot better than the client because I did study law, law, go to law school. I right. know where the source of the law is. I can go read the stat, you know, the regulations. And um, I think the best, you know, in short, um, I keep apprised of, you know, changing laws or regulations right. and information by making myself available to, um, you know, to the content. To access the information, mm -hmm. right. And also having regular conversations and practicing actually doing the work every day every day yeah every that's, day. that's that's compassion yes i touch the case <laughs> maybe sometimes too much <laughs> <laughs> that's what i'm talking about yeah. uh welcome to those of you who are watching us live right now we got stacy banton down there in jamaica we have uh, hi, uh is it my hi my my makeover gallery uh somewhere i don't know where that was located mr j wander up there in new york city uh, shout out to sandra bruno she, very important information thank you guys so much for watching us here live now in the corporate immigration context um what are some of the key considerations for businesses looking for international talent well key consideration i think for business from a business perspective is timeline like when do you need this person to be here because mm -hmm. sometimes depending on the type of visa you're applying for right there's like a many months sometimes you know a year lead time so planning is very important you know coming to me and saying hey i need this person here yesterday right sometimes may not work not because uh, I'm incompetent, but because, you know, appointment times, you know, certain things that we have to do before right. your employee can go even interview for a visa. Another thing is um, companies need to consider compliance. Mm -hmm. So misuse of certain visa types is kind of, you know, common mm -hmm. where they're like, oh, just you come get for here. one thing, right? Yeah, come for one thing, but you're but doing you another. Something. Right. But what people don't realize is whether it's, you know, provoked by the employer or whether it's volunteered by the employee, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the person committing the immigration violation will have to live with the consequences. Oh my goodness. And immigration law, as you know, you may know, having experienced it, is very unforgiving. It Meaning, is. You know, you kind of mess up and there's very little, you know, chances or opportunities to make it right, mm -hmm. even if it wasn't your fault, even if it was a mistake, even if it was caused by, you know, bad information that you got from another lawyer. Right. So you have to be very careful in, you know, um, making decisions because they do have lasting consequences. Absolutely. We, we know immigration don't play. Uh, <laughs> shout out yeah. to Miss Patrice Peters. She says, uh, you get a compliment. Oh. Someone say you don't sound nervous like you said, you thought huh? you were. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, someone says here, um, we have other folks <laughs> watching. Um, someone says, what, what are you, what is your process and time frame so i guess this person is asking from the application process uh, once the process begins how long does it take to go through the whole, the whole until process. the end uh -huh. so it really depends on the type of case but i'd like to think that you know we try to move in an efficient manner mm -hmm. um you know i don't have a huge staff right. i don't have you know people you know working for me abroad um, I have, you know, two assistants, mm -hmm. you know, assisting me in office, um, in our office in, in, in Swanee. 
And it really depends on the case, but, you know, there's a process. There's a clearly defined process from everywhere from, you know, the first touch when we contact, you know, receive a contact from a potential client right. to when they become a client and then how we collect documents, how we, you know, send you things, you know, for your review and signature. And then eventually, you know, there's a quality assurance process. I double check, triple check everything because my name is on the line. On the line. Absolutely. Yep. And your you reputation, know, my reputation, <laughs> is on the line. it is huge. Yes. And, you know, as with any, you know, many lawyers, you know, perfectionism <laughs> um, is a disease that we have. Right. So, um, you know, we try to make sure that we are not um, creating a problem for our clients. Right? Absolutely. So at the end of the day, yes, lawyers are human beings. We're not robots. Even robots, I think, could make mistakes. But at the same time, we I understand that there's lasting consequence. Absolutely. Right? So if it's something that I can fix, mm -hmm. then I will, you know, <laughs> fall on my sword and fix it. But my thing is, you know, why cause that in the first place? Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So, yeah, we have, you know, safeguards in place to make sure that, you know, cases are sent out in a good way. Um, another thing is I don't spare any expense when it comes to like shipping. Right. <laughs> and you would think shipping, who cares about shipping? You're a lawyer. But at the end of the day, if that doesn't get there on time, time. right. And it's very, sometimes some matters are very time sensitive. It's very important. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't really care about the cost. I mm. want it. I want it there when I need it. there. That's what I'm talking about, guys. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Once again, if you're just joining us here live on the Izzy Spotlight podcast, we're speaking to super attorney, <laughs> Miss, <laughs> Mrs. Elizabeth. She from the G law firm here. And of course, we are spe talking specifically about business immigration law. And of course, we can touch a little bit on some of the family stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Big shout outs to Doc. Doc, you asking our work visa still in effect yesterday. Oh, that's the reason why she's here. And we're going to get so we're going to get a little bit deeper with our conversations that be able to answer some of your questions as it relates to uh, getting a, a work visa to come to work here in the United States of America. Of course, we know that many firms are dealing with uh, talent issues mm -hmm. and, 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 and many of them, again, for those of you who are just joining us right now, uh, we feel limited because we don't know that we can actually get talent from beyond our borders. And of course, Miss Elizabeth she, G here, of course, this is what she's, this is what she's an expert in. Yes. I mean, you know, um, the bar rules, <laughs> right. Uh, the Georgia bar rules may, um, prevent me from calling myself an expert okay. without special like certification, certification. Okay. Yeah, but I do this every day. This is my bread and butter mm -hmm. of my business. Right. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about work visas, it really depends on, uh, the type of work that the visa is meant for. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have to look at not only the requirements of the job, right. But we also have to look at whether the intended, uh, applicant is qualified for that job, right. right? So, you know, I want people to understand that, you know, when you Google terms like work visa or how to legally work in the United States, mm -hmm. a lot of the things that pop up are just not, are very, you know, can be misleading because work visas are very specific, right? right. Um, you know, U.S. visas, you know, we have an alphabet soup starting with the letter A, ending mm -hmm. with the letter Z, and probably, you know, a visa for every, you know, letter of the alphabet minus a couple, right? right? And each visa is very specific mm -hmm. to a purpose. It's very specific in terms of its eligibility. Right. And then um, very specific on, you know, the duration, like how long you could have it for. So if you're, you know, saying, if you're telling me I want to work in the United States, I need to know what kind of work do you want to do? Who is your employer, right? Um, how, you know, what does that employer require in terms of require, you know, uh, education or experience in mm -hmm. order to have this job? You may not like my answer because the only option for you might be, you know, um, sponsorship for permanent residence, which right. takes years. Right. Um, or you might hear that, yeah, you're eligible for, let's just say my favorite, uh, the H-1B visa, which is a specialty occupation visa. And specialty occupation is a term of art. So it's right. like legal jargon. I'm sorry, I had to throw it out there. Mm -hmm. um, but it basically means the job requires, you know, at least a bachelor's degree. Okay. It doesn't matter that you have it. It doesn't matter that you have a master's degree or right. PhD. If the job requires a bachelor's degree, it, you may be eligible for sponsorship for an H-1B. Ah, that's a good question. No, because this leads into my next question. It does uh, getting a, a, a visa through a business or through a, a firm, uh, does it require any specific level of education? 
it really depends on the visa, right? Okay. So like we're talking about like an H-1B visa. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have to have a minimum of a bachelor's degree or it's equivalent in order to qualify. Okay. But, you know, not only, you know, we look at it from your perspective, what do you have? The employer, the job that the employer is offering also has to require that job or that, that degree. So someone having, a, uh, someone having a high school diploma, that's not going to really be substantial not for, enough not for an h1b okay right? so but you know let's say you know my other favorite is an e2 visa okay which is what? you know which is uh an investor visa okay you could own your own business and sponsor yourself for a visa um and there's no educational requirement there's hmm. no prior you know experience that you have to have you know being a ceo or anything like that you could have your own small business and sponsor yourself for you know for status in the united states now it's but, limited are, are you, but are you saying that if someone is in a different country is that, is that specifically what you're saying absolutely okay yeah. really so, but it depends on you know the country has to have a treaty with the united states right and that list you can easily find on the on you know on the department of state website right. by googling uh -huh. but you know like off the top of my head i know jamaica is an e2 treaty country okay so if you're a citizen of jamaica um, and you want to be an entrepreneur, be self-employed, have right. your own business, um, you may be eligible for something called an E-2 visa. An E-2 visa. Once again, guys, hold on, let me just, <laughs> you know, a lot of people are watching right now. This is an E-2 visa. Okay, so if you leave in a different country outside of the United States of America and you have a small business, you just might be able or you just might be eligible to get an E-2 visa. That's yeah, what she's saying. You don't even have to have the business in your home country. You can come and set up a business in the United States, or you can buy an existing business, mm -hmm. or go into a partnership with you know a, another you know business partner. Right. As long as you have majority ownership, which is fifty one percent. Okay. Um. So you know there's, but it, it takes money. This is good information. Right. This Thank is you. really good information. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, but it takes money, right? So you know, an investor is somebody who invests money in a right. business. And there's, you know, um, qual you know, there's criteria that have to be met right. in order to satisfy the requirements for the visa. But that's my job to help you formulate that to make sure you stay in compliance. And of course, to make sure that we're successful in getting you the visa. Absolutely. Whoa, this yeah. is some good information. Now, we have another question here from, <laughs> from someone who's asking, what is the minimum financial investment for a small business? That's a very, that's a very common very good question, question I get. Uh -huh. So the regulations uh, do not stipulate a specific dollar amount. So what that means is it doesn't say anywhere in the law that says it has to be minimum this dollar amount. Right. So, but it does require that the business is not marginal, meaning it's not a business that's big enough just for you and your family to live on. Right. It has to have the, the ability the, to, to expand and grow. Exactly. And create jobs and add economic value to the United States. Um, again, there's no number, right? right. So lately, you know, um, with the gig economy, for example, right? And everyone, you know, realizing post COVID that remote work works, right? So right. if you look at a business, the Biggest expense is the human cap, you know, the human ex uh, expense where it's the employees, the labor, right, the payroll. Right. But the other one is having like a brick and mortar, the rent, mm -hmm. right, you know, outfitting the space. If it's like a retail space, the construction costs, all of that is sometimes cost prohibitive for entrepreneurs. However, um, with all of that gone, right, essentially, if you wanted to start a consulting business, right, how much does it cost to start a consulting business? Right. But how much potential does this consulting business have to grow into a six figure, seven figure business? Mm, this is right? interesting. Yeah. So it really depends on, you know, what type of business you want to have. Right. And it has to be, you know, um, the, the investment amount has to also be considered substantial. And substantial, again, is not identified or defined by a specific number. Right. Um, but in my you know, experience, the challenge is probably more about the conversion in the currency. Conversion of the currency, yeah, yeah. because there's a big difference. Yeah, depending of, on where you're coming from. Absolutely. This, yeah. is, this, this is really important information. Once again, yeah. guys, if you're just joining us here live right now, we have the uh, attorney of the G Law Firm, Ms. Uh, Elizabeth G. Mrs. Elizabeth G. Of course, we're talking about business immigration law, and of course, we touched a little bit on family immigration law as well. But this is some really good information. Once again, guys, welcome back to the Ezzy Spotlight Live podcast. And of course, in the studio with me, we're talking about 
uh, business immigration law or corporate immigration law. Of course, we're touching on some of the family immigration law requirements as well, or just information with uh, uh, the G law firm, Ms. Elizabeth, Mrs. Elizabeth G. Of course, she is in the studio. You can see her here on the screen. Round of applause for her again because she's she's dishing out some great nuggets. <laughs> Some good ones for you guys to benefit from. And of course, um, before we go into my next question, I think we I'm going to go back into the chat here and of course uh, see what's going on. We have another question here from Natasha. She's asking, are there any industries that are excluded from getting the E2 visa? Um, none that I know of unless, I mean, you know, you're, there's, you know, you're, no, none that I know of. Right. Yeah. So I mean, it has as long to, as it's legal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <You> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, it has to be legal, and um, you know, it, the important thing is the business cannot be, you know, cannot be marginal. Meaning, right. it has the propensity to grow, to grow, to scale, right? To um, add jobs. Right to the right. U.S. economy mm -hmm. and add you know economic value. Absolutely. So as a spotlight can be a you can if I'm if I'm here or if I'm all over the country, uh, as a small business person myself, I can get an E two visa. Yeah. Just to give you guys an example of what you can do, of course, uh, as an individual, this has a potential of growing into a huge platform and employing people across the globe as well. Absolutely, yes. And you know, th you you mentioned a very important mm -hmm. point. So once your business has been you know certified or approved as an E two enterprise, um, you can bring employees to serve that business from as long as your em essential employees are uh, of the same citizenship right. as you. So okay. if you're, for example, mm. we have a Jamaican client right. and the enterprise, the business enterprise uh, citizenship follows the majority owner. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the owner is, you know, Jamaican. Right. That means, you know, anyone with a Jamaican passport who is deemed, you know, an essential employee, basically, I mean, I'm oversimplifying here, but right. you can bring to serve your business as employee. This is incredible So, you know, you know, since we're in Georgia, you know, we have like the Korean, you know, mm -hmm. conglomerates, right? The plant. Right. Like, or the Hyundai and the Kias mm -hmm. and the SK, they bring a lot of their, you know, essential that's employees. That's why, that's what happens. Yes. Now I understand how that yes. happens because a lot of times you go places, you know, I've traveled into different, I've traveled into different countries, for example. And for example, I remember recently going to the Bahamas mm -hmm. and there were a, a huge hotel being built in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw a lot of uh, Asian because the contractors who are responsible for building that pla that hotel Mm -hmm. They were Asians and they had a lot of Asian employees as well. So this is one of the conditions where you can bring in your people from your country to work with you with no real problems. Right, right. Um, I mean, it, you know, it depends on, you know, what type of visa that they would have to have right. applied for to be compliant. Mm -hmm. You know, because, you know, the E2 essential employee um, visa is great because not only do you get to work mm -hmm. as being the intended uh, beneficiary, but your spouse can work as well. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And any minor children under the age of 21 mm -hmm. can come with you. They can't work, but they can come with you, go to school here, yeah, right. you know, um, public school and enjoy, you know, all aspects all of, the of benefits. life. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we got a call on the phone line. Caller, you are live. Who is it and where you're calling from? Hi, how are you? Good. How are you? My name is I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. My name is Abby, and I'm calling from uh, McDonough, Georgia. Okay. Welcome to the show. And I have a thank you so much. So I have a question. Sure. Go ahead. If 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 I have family in um, Nigeria, and I have a small business here, can I apply for them to get a visa to come here through the business or work visa? Um. I mean, it would depend on what type of business you have and what kind of work you are offering this family member and what their credentials are. So there's a lot of ifs here. Um, for example, you know, if you had a business, for example, just use my business as an example, say that you had a law firm and, you know, you have a relative abroad who, you know, um, would just say is, is a lawyer. Right. And you wanted to hire this person um, to work in your law firm, but their citizenship mm -hmm. and because of life circumstances are living in Nigeria right now. And um, mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes, they qualify to practice as a lawyer in the United States. Then you can sponsor them on an H-1B visa and they could come work for you. The fact that you guys are related doesn't disqualify mm -hmm. or prohibit you from sponsoring this person as long as the job offer is bona fide, meaning it's, you know, legit, right. it's there, and that person mm -hmm. is qualified for the job. 
But I do have to give a disclaimer on the H-1B visa, even though it's my favorite uh, type of visa. Mm -hmm. um, it's not av readily available, meaning you can't just get it because, you know, you're qualified and you want it. Right. There, unfortunately, there's a quota. So annually, there's a set number of visas that are uh, given to new recipients. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, demand always surpasses, you know, um, availability. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that lottery. So because of that, um, there's a lottery. Uh, mm -hmm. It makes me, it, it feels like Christmas in March. <laughs> so the lottery happens in March. Right. And then once, you know, all the winners are notified, um, you know, say, mm -hmm. hey, you got picked in the lottery. Then you have until mm -hmm. June to file your case. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, the employer has to ultimately make that decision Absolutely. right, to file. And once you file it, even though you might get mm -hmm. it approved before, um, you know, within, you know, a couple of months, the official start mm -hmm. date is not sooner than October 1st. So that means mm -hmm. um, the earliest, you know, that that employee can come mm -hmm. would probably be sometime, mm -hmm. you know, right around October. Right. Okay. So there's, you know, there's and limitations. The yeah. What, what are the stipulations when they get here? Do they have to stay with you for six months, a year, or do they have, if, if they're not working with you, do they have to go back, or what no. are the stipulations so, with that? So the, one, the thing about H-1B is that, you know, we never want to force someone to stay with, you know, an employer that they don't want to work with, right? right. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, with, once you have the H-1B and you're selected in the lottery, you're considered mm -hmm. what's called cap exempt. That means you don't have to enter the lottery again for um mm. for six years right. right so the maximum time you can have the h1b is six years unless other mm -hmm. conditions apply and it doesn't mm. you know have to be it's very it's employer specific so that means just because i came here on an h1b visa um, for your company mm. doesn't mean that i could go and work for Ezzy. Right? right doesn't mean that i can go work for another employer the new employer has mm. to sponsor me for another oh. h1b right or so, they have to go back or they have to go back Absolutely. And of course, guys, and th Abby, and of course, if you want more details on that, we're going to try to get as many of, of all other questions answered here. If you want more details, I have the information on the website, uh, how you can contact Miss yeah. Elizabeth. Uh, or the website okay. is mygilaw.com. That's mygilaw.com. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. All righty. So in other words, what we're saying here is that all these are not created equal. Yeah. Pretty that's, much. That's what that's we're saying. That's for sure. <laughs> that is for sure. <laughs> but I mean, it's fascinating because there's so many options, right? right? So I always want to start the conversation with my client. What is the end goal that you want? Mm -hmm. Right. And then we kind of back into what do you have? What can you do? How much can you spend? Right. How much do you want to spend? And then we kind of back into a solution or, you know, sometimes we have more than one option. So how, how much of a difference is it? Because, we, you know, sometimes if you come, like, for example, coming from the Caribbean, you have to make sure that you, you if a family member is going to sponsor you, for example, uh, that family has to prove that they have certain amount of money in a bank in income to be able to take care of that family member that's coming into the country. Mm -hmm. How, what's the difference between that and the cooperate side of the visas? That's a very good question. Um, so in order to qualify as an employer to mm. sponsor somebody, there's no requirement that you show financials. Oh, so it's just, just the business. Yeah, for the biz. Yeah, you have to have a business. It has to, you know, I mean, we have to show sometimes, you know, USCIS or, you know, the embassy would question, you know, whether this is even a legitimate offer. Mm. Um, you know, you never want to, you know, do this because you want to do a favor <laughs> for right. somebody. Right. There has to be a legitimate, you know, business need, and that is to protect yourself right. and your business. Mm -hmm. But you know, with assuming that all of that is, you know, the case, uh, there's no requirement that we submit financials for the business, mm -hmm. as long as you know you have a plan to pay this person the minimum salary that's required. So certain visas come with, like the H one B, a minimum salary that is set by the Department of Labor mm -hmm. that has to be paid on this foreign national. So right. you know it's to prevent discrimination, mm -hmm. right? It's to prevent employers from taking advantage of a foreign labor force. And also it's to protect US jobs and wages right. because you don't want to artificially depress, you know, wages for a specific skill set or specific job because there's somebody who's willing to do it for less for money. less money. Exactly. Mm. Interesting. Once again, guys, if you're just joining us here, of course, we have, we're talking about business uh, corporate uh, immigration law here on the uh, Ezzy Spotlight Live podcast. Of course, this is brought to you by Caribbean International Shipping Services. 
And my guest today is Mrs. Elizabeth G from the G Law Firm here live in the studio. Um, what, what is the biggest misconception about uh, immigration law? I think the biggest uh, misconception is, you know, um, if you know, you make a violation mm -hmm. or you do something that is contrary to what's allowed on the regulations, who's going to find out? How is there, how are they going to know? Right? <laughs> no, one <will> know. <laughs> but, but I'll know. God will know. <laughs> you will know. <laughs> but, you know, really in all seriousness, um, you know, when you sign an application or a petition, you sign under penalty of perjury. Right. So if you lie once, you're going to have to keep lying again and again and again. And we all know, you know from what your mama mm -hmm, told us, you know, it's that first lie. <laughs> it's the cover up that gets you. Right. right. So we don't you know, I never want to advise a client to be in that situation. Right. So it's very, you know, so, you know, another misconception is, you know, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Why are you charging me to answer them? Right. right? And it's because of context. Right. We need to know everything about this specific question you have in order to give you a definitive answer because I know as a professional, as a licensed attorney, mm -hmm. whatever I say, I have to be held accountable for. I'm responsible <laughs> right. for that, right? So uh, I need to do my due diligence and make sure that I ask the right questions to find out the information that I need in order to give you an answer that you can rely on with confidence. Absolutely. Absolutely. Once again, guys, if you just <laughs> join us, if you've got many more questions, of course, feel free to join us in the, in the chat room. And of course we can answer some of your questions right quick. And if you can't, if you don't have the time to do that, of course, you can always log onto the website at my G law firm.com. That's my G J J I law firm. No, my G law, L A G law. Dot com, yes. Yep. Mygelaw.com, yep. yes. Mygelaw.com. <laughs> I'm going to put it up on the screen again so that no one can <laughs> make sure you get it correct thank here. Thank you. Yeah, there it is. Mygelaw.com. <laughs> I have it written up correctly. All right. Thank um, you. So the next question I'm going to ask you is, now, uh, we, we talk about people coming here on a business uh, uh, sponsorship from a corporate standpoint. Uh, we know that bringing your families here and coming on the business on a corporate uh, status uh, could be different. Now, is the immigration law, the process is a lengthy one? Uh, how long, how, how lengthy is the process uh, today, for example? Mm -hmm. So if you're coming from outside the United States, right. depending on what type of visa you're coming from, mm -hmm. um, you know, with um, some visas require a petition to be filed to USCIS, mm -hmm. get that approval, and then you can apply for your visa at the embassy. What folks have to understand is the way we transact immigration um, applications and petitions depends on where you are, whether that be outside the United States or whether you're here on U.S. soil right. and maintaining lawful status. Right. So mm -hmm. that really would depend on this. You know, that would determine the strategy. But, you know, assuming that you're outside the United States and you're coming on an H-1B visa, mm -hmm. first thing we have to do is apply for the petition or the employer has to apply for the petition, so right. permission to hire you. And then when you get that approval, based on that, you go to the U.S. Embassy in your home country and apply for the visa. Right. And that is an individual application, meaning they will look at... Have you been in the U.S. before? Did you ever overstay? Or did you have any criminal you know, Background. matters that we need to know about? Mm -hmm. Or if you've never been in the United States before, are you likely to um, you know, misuse this visa, right? So they will, there's you know, application criteria or questionnaire that you have to answer in order to get that yes. And when you do, they put that visa in your passport, and that visa gives you permission to seek entry into the United States. So when you, you know, get on the plane and you, you know, land and you're, um, you know, before the Customs and Border Patrol, then, um, you know, you present your visa and you're saying, look, I'm coming here uh, with a job offer from XYZ company. Here's the approval notice of the petition. Here's my visa and some other documents that, you know, um, I will send you to carry with you. And they are like, welcome to the United States. And right. that's when you get your status, right? So while we're on this topic, I want to kind of talk about a pet peeve okay. of mine. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So a pet peeve of mine is when folks um, interchangeably use the terms status and visa. Okay. They're two very different Different things. one. Yes, that's yes. a good That's a good conversation. Yes, because I, you know, have experience with, you know, a client who could have been, you know, hurt. They could have lost their business because of that, um, you know, 
mistake. Okay. Okay. So status, as I said earlier, is something you get when you land on U.S. soil. Mm -hmm. So when you present your passport and your visa, mm -hmm. and then you know Customs and Border Patrol says welcome to the United States, is when you get that status. Right. So if you're presenting a tourist visa, you enter as a tourist. If you're presenting an H-1B visa, you enter as an you know H-1B. Right. Um, visa is a document that you get from a U.S. embassy abroad. So you cannot get a visa in the United States. Right. So sometimes what happens is um, we have clients who come on, say, a tourist visa, mm -hmm. and you know they get six months, right? And they you know go visit family, they go talk to us, you know, a lot of people, they get to go see the living conditions of the United States, and they're like, "Man, I want to live here. Right. I, I like it here, mm -hmm. but I want to go to school." You know, I want to study and get my advanced degree or I want to get my bachelor's degree because I never got to finish it. Whatever the reason, they decide that they want to go to school. Right. So they come and see me and we can change your status to a student in the United States mm. without you having to go back home. Gotcha. Now, the limitation of that is if you change your status in the U.S. and you leave, so you leave the United States, mm -hmm. you will not be able to come back until you get the accompanying visa in your passport, mm. right? So just because you changed your status to a student in the U.S. Yes. doesn't magically put a visa in your passport. You need to go home and get that. And, you know, we sometimes coordinate that depending on like summer break, winter break, when people, you know, go home and visit. Or some people are like, look, I don't need to go home. Right. <laughs> I don't want to go home. Um, you know, after my, you know, visa, uh, after my education and my diploma, I'm going to, you know, get a job and I'm going to get an H-1B, right. you know, and I'm going to, you know, get my American dream and get sponsored through an employer. Right. So people have various plans. Um, and but, you know, you have to understand, you know, when you set foot outside the United States, you may not be able to come, come back, back unless you have that visa or a visa to come back with. I think a lot of people uh, get that information misinterpreted as a result of the status and the visa, and they don't understand why sometimes immigration yeah. asks them to they have to leave the country and they stay there for a much longer time because now you violated right. the actual status uh, right. or, or the visa that you had initially. Right. Exactly. So <laughs> if you, you know, um, you know, another thing I get is, you know, the tourist visa, for example, uh -huh. depending on, you know. They're usually valid for 10 years, right. right? But each entry, so each time you cross the border, you're granted uh, six months, okay? Absolutely. And some people are like, no, my visa this said I could stay 10, 10 years. years. And I'm like, no, ma'am, we yeah. cannot have you, you know, that does not, that's not how it works, yeah, exactly. right? So it, it proceeds by the I-94, which is a document mm -hmm. that you get when you enter the United States. Right. And you have to be really cognizant of the expiration date of that. And if your plans change after you come and you want to stay longer or stay or change to a different status, um, it's best practice to, you know, be proactive and have a plan. Right. right? Absolutely. If we have a plan and we execute that plan well, more than likely you're going to get what you want and, you know, get the outcome that you want. Absolutely. But if we're, you know, like chickens with our head cut off and doing <laughs> things last minute and, you know, <laughs> um, you know, running around, you know, hair on fire, then, you know, there's a likelihood that you may not get, you know, what you're looking for. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So, I think we're going to have time to squeeze in one final question, one final question from the chat room here. And someone is saying here, uh, if you have a business, while you are on an e-visa and your business goes bankrupt, mm -hmm. do you have to go back or return to your country of origin? Um, not necessarily. So say that you have, you know, you had an E2 business mm -hmm. and then you decided to close that business, right? right? Because it wasn't performing well. Then um, what you'll get is like a 60 day grace period mm -hmm. and you can find an employer who will you know, who can employ you. Okay. Okay. So no, one option could be another E2 business with the same citizenship. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we'll go back to Jamaica. Right. Um, so say that, you know, you're a Jamaican national, you have Jamaican citizenship and you have a, you know, business contact or a friend or somebody who, you know, wants to employ you and they're an E2 business, right. they could petition you for an E2 essential employee um, visa. Or if, you know, the you know, stars aligned and the timing is working out, you can change your status to an H-1B, right? Right. If you don't necessarily want to work and you're like, you know what, I need to learn more about, you know, 
running a business or I want to go get some, you know, uh, formal education about it and get an MBA, mm -hmm. you can change your status to a student and go to school. Right. So you don't necessarily have to go back if you, if that's not what you want. Absolutely. Okay. This is this is incredible information. Once again, guys, if you're just joining us, of course, you missed a lot. <laughs> but of course, if you want more information, uh, the web link, the website link is on the, is on the screen right now. MyGLaw.com. That's MyGLaw.com. Make sure you contact Mrs. Elizabeth G. She is the expert or well, she is the attorney that can take care of your concerns, answer your questions and take you down that road that you need to travel if you need to, if you have family members or friends who was looking uh, to get some assistance, um, this is the website you go to. Again, this is myglaw.com. Uh, do you have any final words, any final thoughts you want to share be with the viewers before with you the go? the community? Uh, well, I mean, this was my first like live, live podcast yeah. type thing. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Uh -huh. um, I love... It was smooth? You know, yeah. I love sharing information. Right. Um, you know, I... I naturally want to empower my clients mm -hmm. to make the best decision for them and their family. Right. And I feel like uh, you kind of touched on this where, you know, um, access to information, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a finance, you know, like a financial decision. Right. Um, if you think about, you know, the value of having your chance at the American dream or your value, the value of having your business and running your business in the U S making American dollars, right? What does that mean to you? Like how do, how much is that worth to you? Right. right. So lots of times, you know, I'm not saying this because I'm an attorney, but you know, um, what I see a lot is that people are discouraged because there's, you know, a consultation fee or there's, you know, there's a legal fees. Cause I got, you know, I got to eat too. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you know, um, with, all serious, uh, joking aside, um, you know, I'm a business myself. I'm an entrepreneur, right? right? So right. my job is to, you know, recognize your potential and, um, you know, hope you can see value in the services that we're providing. Right. And we're not just looking at the dollars and cents, but we're looking at the value that you're getting because compared to the opportunity and the potential, um, whatever you end up paying me or anyone else to get, you know, your visa mm -hmm. or get your status, um, is probably a drop in the bucket. Right. Yeah. And it's business. It's business. Exactly. <laughs> it is business. Once again, exactly. Mrs. Elizabeth G here from the G, my G law dot com guys. Don't forget. And once again, I have the link on the website, my G law dot com. Make sure you contact her, log onto the website today, uh, and make contact. Of course, she can answer all of your questions and lead you down the right path. Um, she is, I want to, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come in and talk to me about this cooperate and business immigration law. Uh, I think it was great information Thank you. and uh, I think you could do a great job because <laughs> a lot of folks talk about the other aspect of getting your family to come to the U.S., uh, the regular family visas, mm -hmm. but not much people are talking about the business side of it. Right. And yeah, because you, you, you want to work with your family. You trust your family. Right. Well, depends on who you're talking to. <laughs> We don't want a family to know what we're doing. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, some, t some people, you know, especially, um, you know, they, their legacy, right, is their family-owned business. Right. So naturally they want to work with, you know, people that they're comfortable with and people they implicitly trust. So there's no, you know, limitation um, on sponsoring, you know, family members for Visa. So call me if you have a question. There you go. Once again, myglaw.com. That's myglaw.com. It's on the website again. Of course, I want to thank you again for coming by thank here you. and talking to thank me you. live. Of course, guys, don't forget if you want to be a guest here on the Ezzy Spotlight Live podcast, make sure you log on to the website at ezzyspotlight.com or you can send me an email at media. That's media at ezzyspotlight.com as well.